Road Missionary Baptist Church of Linside, West Virginia. Thank you for tuning in with us. If you happen to be listening by uh, Facebook or YouTube or if you're out listening on the radio, Fellowship Hall, wherever you may be, we just welcome you. Thank you for tuning in. May God bless you and challenge you this evening with truth. And as we begin our service, let's ask God's blessing on the time. Father, as we come to you in prayer, we come to you and just thank you, Father, for your love and mercy toward us. And Father, as we begin this time, Father, to expound upon your word, we just ask that the Holy Spirit will guide and direct us unto truth and fill this room. Father, just join us. Father, we just ask that you'd search us out, Father, that you'd bless us, that you'd challenge us and help draw us, Father, to you. And Father, we realize that we make many mistakes and we falter and we fail. And Father, we just ask that you forgive us of these things and help us to always live the best we can for you. And Father, just help us to be what you would have us to be and help us, Father, to hold up the banner of Christ, to live the life that you expect us to. And Father, help us to always ask you and submit ourselves to you, Father, each day. And we ask, Father, that you'd walk with us and just help us, Father, to, to draw others to you. And Father, we just want to pray for those that we're around every day, Father, that uh, you'd help us have an opportunity to share our witness, our testimony, and to uh, share the gospel with them. And Father, we ask now that you would be with us, that the Holy Spirit will speak through us, and Father, that we'll be challenged. And Father, we can all be blessed by being here this evening. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of the message this evening is The New Man. The New Man. This morning we looked at Saul of Tarsus. Kind of a short summary of it. The topic was about Saul of Tarsus. Most of you were here. We know that he was a persecutor of the first followers of Jesus. Saul on the Damascus Road had an encounter with Jesus, didn't he? There he was humbled. He was stricken physically blind, but his spiritual eyes was open. He had a heart change, didn't he? He become new. We talked about 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, where it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. We're going to pick up where we left off this morning on Acts chapter 9. If you want to turn there in your Bibles, we're going to start with verse 19. We actually talked about verse 19 and 20 a little bit this morning, but I'm going to recap on those just a little bit, and we'll go from there. Acts chapter 9, begin with verse 19. Verse 19 reads, And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples, which were at Damascus. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. We read here that after certain days with the disciples, which were in Damascus, Saul immediately went out to the synagogues to proclaim Jesus as the Son of God. Remember, days prior to this, he was persecuting anyone who believed or followed Jesus. And now he's out proclaiming Jesus, the Son of God. What's the difference in Saul? Saul met Jesus. Jesus is the difference. He met him personally on that old Damascus road. And Saul come to know Jesus as the son of God. There as he was put on his knees in the dust, you know, the bright light shone around him and he heard the voice and he was down on his knees as far as he could go. First, we must realize that we must know Jesus as the Son of God. Amen. To be saved, we've got to know Jesus. We've got to know of him, that he's the Son of God, to accept the fact that Jesus died to pay our sin debt on the cross of Calvary. He rose from the dead. He conquered death and the grave. Amen. You've got to know him first. You've got to meet him. Remember also, Saul had received the Holy Ghost and was empowered to preach Jesus, the Son of God. Let's look at verse 21. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which is called on the name? Let me start over. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem and came hither for that intent 
that he might bring them bound unto the chief priest. People could believe that this was the same Saul, the same person. Isn't he the one that's persecuting everybody? Wasn't he the one coming, wanting to have everyone arrested? And he's, he's calling Jesus the son of God. Saul was against Jesus and his followers, and they, were, they couldn't believe he's changed sides. How can people just do this? Saul was a new creature in Christ. You know, I've thought about that. You'll hear about people that live a rough life and they've been in trouble and they've done all kinds of evil deeds and things. And you'll get saved and praise God for that. And they, their life's cleaned up and they change and everybody can't believe it. Well, that's old so-and-so and he done all these bad things. Well, he used to steal off of me. He used to do this and he was a, used to be run from bar to bar and from woman to woman and done all these things. And they remember all those evil deeds. But they fail to look at the new man, the new man. When Christ comes in, you're going to change. That brings up the glory bumps all up my back to know and to think the work that God is doing in our life as a believer. Amen. That's what happened to Saul. You know, uh, we was talking about in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's new. He's a new creature. The old things are passed away and all things become new. Saul was new. The evidence of Christ in Saul's life was undeniable. It was undeniable. That is where the your testimony comes in. When you don't participate in the old talk that you used to talk, you don't participate with the so-called friends that was living rough. When you don't have no, you don't have to pick friends. When I got saved, people I hung out with that I thought were my friends, once I got saved, started going to church. Those friends was gone. They didn't want nothing to do with me. I didn't have to choose them because they did not choose me. Why? Because I was different. My want-tos changed. I could do anything I want to as a Christian, but guess what? My want-tos has changed. Things I used to want to do, the talk I used to talk, and the things I used to say, and the dirty and foul language I used to uh, participate in and was a, was a professional at. I didn't want to do that no more. Yes, every now and then I mess up. Yes, every now and then I do things and say things I shouldn't. I'm not denying that. But when I do, I'm sorry. I'm convicted of it. I try not to, but I fail every once in a while. But you know what? God is working in my life. Is he working in your life? That's the evidence that Christ has moved in. Amen. There's two evidences that Paul of Paul's conversion. In verse 11, he prayed. Well, he wouldn't have been praying uh, like he was there if, he, if there hadn't been a change. And he preached in verse 20. I'll read those two scriptures to you quickly. Verse 11 says, And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street, which is called straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he what? He prayeth. He was praying. He was waiting on that. That visit, wasn't he? And then verse 20, a straight way, he what? Preached Christ. He preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the son of God. Can you remember when you got saved, did you tell anybody? Usually when somebody gets saved, they're going to tell everybody. It don't matter who it is. You're excited. I got saved. I got saved. And some people want to hear it. Some people can relate to it. Some people call praise the Lord. And some people's like, what's wrong with you? Because they don't know any better. You know, isn't it sad that when you first get saved, the, glo the joy you have and the excitement you have to tell everybody and to tell them, hey, Jesus saved me and how great it is. And then after a period of time, you can't twist somebody's arm enough to get them to, to admit that they're a Christian. Is there something wrong with that picture? Sure is, isn't it? Saul preached what he knew. What did he know? He knew Jesus was the Son of God. You'll talk to people and say, if you go out and share the gospel, do you go out and share some, tell somebody your testimony of being saved? Well, I don't know what to say. I, I, I don't know the scriptures that well. I don't know what to say. Tell them what you do know. 
Tell them what you do know. Did Jesus come into your heart? Do you feel different? Are you different? Is your life better? If you're saved, it's got to be because you're a new creature, amen? There's a lot I don't know. I don't know now, and I didn't know then when I first got saved. But I knew one thing. I knew there was a difference in me. The blind man, he says, the only thing I can tell you was I was blind, but now I can see. He says, I don't know about all these questions you're asking me, but I know I was blind, and now I see. So, you know, we can't tell what we do know. Amen? Saul preached what he knew, a lesson for the Christian today. Share the gospel, what you do know. Just tell people what God has done for you. Has God done anything for you? Well, if he has, can you not tell somebody else? How about when you get up? How, how about when you're going through a storm, when you're having problems, and you pray and say, Lord, please help me? Do you have a testimony that when God has helped you? Have you been sick that you didn't know if you was going to make it, and you asked God to help you through it? Did he help you through it? You're here. He helped you through it, didn't he? How many times have you cried out to God and he carried you through the storm? I like the old, uh, I reckon it's a poem of the footprints in the sand. I think that says so much. So, Lord, how come I don't see the footprints? He said, because I was carrying you. How many times has God carried you and I through storms, through valleys of, in a life? He wasn't walking with us. He was carrying us. Let's continue on with verse 22. Verse 22, but Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. He increased in strength and knowledge, didn't he? We should be growing and becoming stronger in our faith as we walk through this life, shouldn't we? As we go through valleys and we go through things and the more we pray and study and fellowship, we should grow and our faith should grow, shouldn't it? We should, we should become stronger. Let's see what Paul done. Paul, we talked about this morning, he was very intelligent. He was a brilliant person. He was educated and uh, he had a lot of knowledge and conviction. And when he was talking to these here at Damascus, we know that the Jews was against Jesus, wasn't he? And he knew more about things than they did. He knew more about it and had more education. And it says, and he confounded the Jews because he knew the laws. He knew all the things that they did because he was very smart, very educated, very brilliant. He preached Jesus, the crucified Nazarene, was the Christ and therefore God the Son. How did they perceive this? How did the Jews feel about this? It upset them, didn't it? It upset them. It brought conviction to them. When the gospel's being proclaimed, Satan's not going to sit back without a fight, is he? When you're doing the things of God, just know that you're going to run into to resistance, aren't you? You're going to run into resistance. When you're trying to do the right things and you're praising God and you're doing the right thing, get ready. You're going to get blindsided. Satan's going to throw something at you. Let's look at verse 23. And after that many days were filled, the Jews took counsel to do what? To kill him. Here he is, Saul doing the right thing. He's preaching Jesus. The Jews is mad at him, and they want to kill him. They want to kill him. Why did the Jews take counsel to kill him? The Jews, his own people, crucified Jesus. Look at, uh, I'll read this to you. Uh, John 1, 10, 11 says, He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. They crucified him. They crucified him. Here is Saul bringing this to their attention. Verse 24, but their laying await was known of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and led him down 
by the wall in a basket. They had all intentions to kill Saul. They saw him as a traitor. They saw him as a threat, just like he did Jesus, didn't he? They thought, we're going to have to get rid of this guy. He's a problem. Here he was on our side. He was out getting all these flowers, and we was going to have him arrested and do something with him and stop this nonsense. And now he has turned and went the other way. He is a threat. He is a threat. We're going to have to do something with him. After Saul escapes, he goes to Jerusalem. Let's look at verse 26. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he said to joy himself to the disciples, but they were what? They were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. They hadn't got the news. They hadn't got the news and understood that Saul, about Saul's conversion. The disciples in Jerusalem did not know. They didn't know. I thought about that. I guess social media wasn't as good in those days, you reckon? They didn't get a text. They didn't get it on social media that all these things had taken place. Let's look at verse 27. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he was with them coming in and going out of Jerusalem. And he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians, but they went about to slain. Every time he took a stand, somebody got mad, didn't he? They didn't like it. They didn't like it. And if you back up there and looking at where he, Barnabas says, hey, look. Look at what he done and, and talked about to, to show them, prove to them that he had uh, changed. Let's look at uh, verse 30. Which when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. There's a reading here I want to read to you. Let me tell you some information about this reading. The information about this, in his conversion was probably the year of A.D. 37. He spent time in Damascus preaching, then he went to Arabia. That's in Galatians chapter 1, verses 15 through 18. I'll read that in just a minute. Returning to Damascus after many days, which we've read tonight in Acts 9, 23. I want to read this Galatians to you. Galatians 1 15 says, But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I confer not with flesh and blood. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. But other of the apostles saw I none, save James, the Lord's brother. Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God I lie not. Afterwards, I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia and was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed, and they glorified God in me. So this covered a period of probably about three years during which the time Paul was being taught the truce, God's mystery of the church. When he was back in Damascus, he was attacked by the Jews and had to leave through the window, which we talked about tonight. This takes us from A.D. 37 to A.D. 39, at which time he went to Jerusalem where he met the apostles. That's what we talked about. He went to, the, to uh, Jerusalem. The apostles there was afraid of Paul, and it was Barnabas who introduced Paul to the group. That's what we talked about tonight. The fact that Paul was a stranger and even an enemy to the apostles is important. It proves that he got his message from, of grace from Christ himself and not from men. He learned and got his grace from Jesus on the Damascus Road, didn't he? He didn't hear from it or get it from anybody else. It comes straight from Christ. 
Further persecution made it necessary for Paul to leave, so he returned to his home at Tarsus in Galatians 1.21, I just read, suggests that Paul preached in that region, and Acts 15.23 indicates that there were churches in that area. It is possible that during his stay of four or five years, Paul preached the gospel of grace of God and established Gentile churches. When the center of his ministry moved from Jerusalem to Antioch, a Gentile city, Barnabas went and sought for Paul and brought him back to minister with him. When we look at the things that Paul went through, how he wasn't, they didn't know of his conversion. We see his faithfulness to, to preach the word. And we could go on and on and on. There's all kinds of studies and things about Paul. Paul wrote Several books of the Bible. Look at all the things that he was faithful in that we can learn from. There are so many things. What can we learn from Saul being Paul? What can we learn from Paul? For one, we need to claim your victory in Christ. Claim the victory we have. We shouldn't let anybody strip us of our joy. We shouldn't let Satan strip us of our joy of our salvation. Don't let the world talk you out of doing the things that God is calling you to do. Look at the opposition he had. Every time he went to do what God called him to do, he ran into opposition. So many times you get excited to, to, to participate and to do things for, for your Lord. And every time there will always be somebody that will grumble or complain. Or the devil will throw something in, in your way. Don't be ashamed of who you are. Don't be ashamed of what God has done in your life. Don't be ashamed to, to admit that you're a Christian. Don't be ashamed to pray in front of others. Don't be ashamed to carry a Bible. Don't be ashamed to do the right things. Don't be ashamed to be the one that when something's nasty is going on in your workplace around so-called friends and people that you walk off and don't want to participate in. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. Don't be ashamed of Jesus Christ. It's time we as God's people stand up and stand firm in our faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? We're being put down and told we can't stand up and stick up for the things of God. If somebody's doing something that's against God's will, homosexuality, all these different things that's going on, oh, we're not allowed to say anything. We're not allowed to ever tell a friend that what you're participating in is, is, is not right. It might offend somebody. You know, it's a shame that we are where we're at. Be faithful where you are. It's not always easy to be the odd person out. It's not. It's not. It's hard sometimes to be the honest one. It's hard sometimes to have to admit a guilt or a problem. It's hard to, if you do something wrong, to have to go apologize to a boss or someone in authority. Be faithful, you know, and always remember, people always want to remember the old you. And guess what? Satan wants you to remember the old you. Think about that. He don't want you, Satan don't want you to excel. He don't want you to have a joy. He don't want you to live a life of joy in front of your people. He wants you to think, well, look at all the times that you used to do this. Well, that's been forgiven under the blood of Jesus Christ. If he's forgot it, why can't you forget it? Why can't you forgive yourself and say, I'm not doing that anymore? What you didn't do yesterday or last week or last month, you can't go back and do nothing about it. Don't make that mistake again. Put your eyes, like Paul said, you know, he was reaching out to the prize, run the race. People will always remember the old you until you show them you're different with your faithfulness. Amen? Amen to that. Your faithfulness will prove out the new you. That's what will make the difference. Just like the analogy earlier, we talked about people that did all them bad things and they get saved. When that person, they see them faithfully serving their Lord, going to church, Praying, doing the things a Christian should do, after a period of time, they'll see all new. They won't see none the old. Amen? Amen? Quit looking back. When you live and walk by faith, 
the devil surely going to try to trip you up. When you're trying to do the right things, like you said, I'm going to have a devotion at a so-and-so time. I'm going to do certain things, and, or I'm going to read the Bible through, or whatever it is that you're striving to make things better. That phone will ring, somebody will come, there will always be something to trip you up or discourage you. You know you're doing the right thing when Satan tries to blindside you. Amen? Amen. Every time you're trying to do the right thing, you can just figure on something's going to interrupt it. He don't want you to make a difference. He don't want you to be different. He don't want you to have the joy and the testimony. Much of our past, much of our past is never, is never worthy of our future, is it? Our past is never worthy of our future. What's back there is gone. That's what we got to look forward to. Amen. Remember this. Jesus said in John 15, 18, If the world hates you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. Don't expect the world to love you. Don't expect everybody to be in love with you for living for the Lord. They hated him, didn't they? Well, if they hated him, and we're Christ-like, what do you think we're going to get? We're not going to be in a who's who's club. And that's what makes it tough. That makes it tough in the workplace, in school, our young people. When you tell your kids, well, try to pick you some good Christian friends. Well, why don't you try to pick some good Christian friends? Because they're far in between. And just because people go to church doesn't make them Christ-like. Same thing for us. Because we're here at church doesn't mean that we're Christ-like unless we live up to it when we go through these doors. Amen? Saul lived up to it. Immediately, he changed. And he never looked back, did he? He never looked back. That's a challenge to you and I tonight. You need to ask yourself, does people see the old me or do they see something different? Challenge your brothers and sisters in Christ. Maybe you're the one that needs to bring a verse out every now and then. The daily bread books, I've used them for years, used to use them in the machine shop. Would you believe the little call to glory, we used a different one at that time, it's called daily bread. In a machine shop, I started reading that every morning when I opened up my toolbox. And I challenged, made a game out of it, and I started challenging a buddy. And if you didn't read it by a certain time, you, you got hit in the shoulder. We were just carrying on, young, young guys. Before, when I went to work there, you never heard nobody pray. You never heard about anybody going to church. And that, that little thing that we got going, next thing you know, another one got into it. Another young guy got into it. And we started challenging each other. As time went on, there were several even older men that come out of the woodwork, and we started to talk about the things of God. Later on, there was two or three guys, not because of anything I'd done, but because of what God done through me, that they come to know Jesus Christ. Huh? Just by being obedient, reading the Lord's Scripture every day. And you know what? There's a young man right up in Princeton right now. He comes to me and says, if it weren't for you, I'd have never been saved. There's another uh, gentleman up in the Weirton, West Virginia. He's a pastor up there. Talked to him. Lord laid it on my heart. And it all started with a daily reading. Listen, you never know what little things that you can do can have such an eternal value for someone. Be faithful. Do what you can do. Share what you do know. Love the Lord and be true to him. You can't go wrong. God knows your heart. Ask God for opportunity and let God work in your life. There's people all around us. You don't have to quote every scripture in the Bible to see them saved. And we've got tracks. You've got all kinds of things. Everybody's got you got cell phones that you can put all kinds of electronic help on there that's, that's good stuff that you can use that you can put on there. You can save it on there. Be obedient to your Lord. Share the word. Be faithful. May God bless you. If God spoke to you tonight, let God have his way with you.